those of you who haven't seen this presentation before, let, let me uh, apologize in advance. But uh, what we'll be, what I'm going to be talking about is uh, what happened in the economy in 2018, what we can expect in 2019, and then uh, what's going on in the political arena that might affect uh, the economic uh, economic growth. So. Uh, what I'd like to do, I'll, I'll kind of run through some of this. Uh, a lot of this is based on uh, Chapman University's uh, Center for Economic Research. They do uh, forecasts on uh, both at the national level, California, and also the uh, local level, uh, Southern California as well. And so a lot of it's based on, on their data uh, rather, rather than mine. Uh, but uh, I'd like to kind of do that a little more quickly than I normally do and then open it up for questions and I say I'd like to do that I probably won't uh, because you know I this will take longer than I anticipate but uh, but anyway ho hopefully get your questions especially your take on what's going on on the ground uh, with the economy because you observe this probably faster than economists uh, do we're relying on data that comes from the transactions you do uh, but also I'd like to get your your take on what's going on politically because there's a Great, a lot of uncertainty associated with that. So let's uh, just start off with uh, with what happened. And uh, last year was a great year. It's the fastest economic growth since 2005. And uh, although the stock market was down six percent, but it was up 30, almost 30 percent the year before. So it's been uh, over the two-year period. It's been a great year. Consumer confidence still high, higher than it was at the beginning of 2018. Uh, but the big the big indicator of how well things are going is 2.9 million new jobs in 2018. 2.9 million. And this follows, uh, uh, this, this would bring the total to about 4.8 million new jobs since uh, President Trump took August uh, in uh, the end of, end of January. And to put that in perspective, that comes out to about 2.5 million jobs a year. That's up from 473,000 jobs a year during the uh, Obama administration. But even if you go from the trough of the recession, uh, you're still averaging about 2 million jobs a year uh, during the recovery. And it's ramped up to more like 2.5 million and now 2.9 million uh, here. So it's been great news uh, for, the, for the economy. And those are just a few headline numbers, but there's a lot of stuff that goes along with it. The unemployment rate is only 3.9 percent. That's the lowest since 1969. It's 17 percent lower than it was uh, two years ago. Uh, there's uh, the unemployment rate for Hispanics and, uh, and African Americans is the lowest ever recorded. Uh, the number of people on food stamps and uh, getting unemployment and all these things that go along with that are, are lower than ever before. So it's been really a great year. And one of the things I've mentioned is in the past is when you have economic growth, you reduce economic inequality. When you have slow economic growth, you tend to expand economic inequality. Because if you think about it, if the economy is growing at 1%, who's going to benefit from that 1%? You know, the, the most connected, the most skilled, the best, uh, the most experienced. It's the, the uh, as the economy grows faster, people that are less experienced, less skilled, less trained are the ones that are, that are disproportionately benefiting. So anytime you've got the economy growing at 2%, you're going to see increased inequality. And when it pumps up to, to you know, 3% plus is where you really see the benefits uh, more widely shared. And so that's definitely been the case, uh, uh, case this year. Per capita GDP grew 3.4% uh, last year. And again, during the Obama administration, it grew at 0.6% a year. So it's growing at five to six times the rate it was over the previous eight years. Now I mentioned the Obama administration. If you also looked at the Bush administration before that, the economic results would be very similar uh, to the Obama administration. So when uh, uh, during that eight year period uh, for George Bush, the economy grew at about 2.2% a year, and it grew about 2.1% a year uh, during the Obama administration. So regardless of who, it's not a partisan thing, regardless of who you're comparing it to, it's 50% higher than it had been. In fact, of the seven quarters since Trump's been president, uh, six of them, the economy has grown at more than 
and the average has been about 3.2 percent. And the reason I'm kind of belaboring this is, is during the uh, election, there's a lot of discussion about you know, his projections the, that, you know, if you did what he wanted to do, the economy would grow significantly faster. And their argument was the new normal is 2% growth. You're not going to do any better than that. And in fact, uh, uh, he has, his, uh, it's, I shouldn't say he has, but it has shifted while he's been president back to the historical norm. So about 3.2% is what the economy has grown if you look at sort of a 50-year horizon that's about the average growth. It's really the past from 2000 to 2016 is where you had the stagnation and, and frustration associated with it. But let me give you uh, uh, a few other numbers. And incidentally of, of some of those numbers too, uh, of those 4.8 million new jobs since Trump's been president, 2.3 million are uh, Hispanic. Uh, individuals, so a large, uh, almost half of the uh, of the employment growth has come from that. Uh, if you look at uh, the specific numbers, it's uh, expected to come in at about three percent uh, in 2018 for the U.S. economy. Uh, California and Orange County has grown a little more slowly. Uh, for uh, for the United States, that's a GDP number. For when you get a state, there's really not a state. GDP. So we look at payroll growth as the indicator of, of economic growth. So California grew faster uh, in, during the recovery than the rest of the country and now it's kind of slowing down a little bit relative to the rest of the country. Uh, we don't have the numbers for Inland Empire yet. Uh, those will be coming out at the economic forecast I think next week. Uh, somewhere out here. Uh, we'll, do, we'll release the numbers but they should be fairly, fairly similar. Uh, to, to Orange County. And uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, why the, the big economic growth. And uh, there's a couple things that, that are, are, are driving this. And, the, and I'm kind of finding out where I wrote them down, but uh, I guess I didn't. But uh, first thing is when you think about what economic growth is, there's only two ways you can, the economy can grow. Either you have more resources that are deployed or the productivity of those resources is higher. That's really it. You, you, you more stuff or you do more, stu more with the stuff that you have. And uh, the, the part that, you know, economists tend to look at things like, uh, you know, money supply and, and uh, uh, <coughs> consumer spending and government spending and, you know, trade deficits and all that kind of stuff. But uh, one of the things they tend to underestimate in my mind is the effect of deregulation. Uh, every regulation forbids a transaction that the two parties think was mutually beneficial. So generally speaking, not exclusively, generally speaking, that's going to reduce economic growth. Now again, there are certain transactions you don't want to occur regardless of what their impact is on economic growth, uh, but if you reduce regulation, two things happen. There's an opportunity to bring more resources into the economy, and there is an opportunity to use them more productively. And so you see a lot of that. And I'll give you one example. The oil industry, uh, the increase in oil production in the past five years has been, in the United States, it's increased 50%. Well, that 50%, that's 3 million barrels a day, a little over 3 million barrels a day. That adds about 0.3% to the economic growth of the country. If you take 3 million <laughs> barrels times $52 a barrel times 365 days a year, it goes on and on and on. Uh, I, I may be just making up these numbers, but I think it comes out to right about 0.3%. So instead of if you didn't change the, the policy, now again, you may think this is bad news, uh, but if you did not change the policies to free up more lands for oil leases and other uh, regulations, instead of 3%, that'd be 2.7% growth. Another factor is the part labor participation rate. So there's two changes in those. If you think of those 4.8 million new jobs over the past uh, two years, some of them are people that are unemployed that are now working. And some of them that were people that weren't looking for a job that decided to start working. So the labor participation rate is bumped up. That's the percentage of people that are actually looking for a job. And it's gone up about 2%. Well, that means 3 million people are in the workforce now working that weren't looking for a job before. 
So if you take three million times whatever those people are producing, uh, that adds about one and a half percent to economic growth. And the people that were looking for a job that were unemployed before that now have jobs, again, that's the other percent. So that's basically where all that three percent comes from. People who are unemployed that are now working, people that weren't wor looking for a job that, or at least not looking hard by the, the way the government defines it, going back to work and resources like oil being one example being brought onto the table. So you're getting more people working, more resources into the economy, and that's going to increase economic growth. And most of that comes from changes in regulation at least the, the resource part. And so that doesn't, there's no big bill that somebody passed or signed and, or any of that sort of thing. But uh, now again, you may think of this as bad news because taking more land and making it available for extraction of minerals, again, it has, creates environmental disruptions that you might not think are worth the economic growth. But the point is it does lead, to, that's the source of the economic uh, uh, growth. So, uh, so that's really where I think a big difference occurs is the change in regulation frees up more resources and it allows them to be used a little more, product, uh, more productively and that's why instead of growing at 2% like we have been for the past 15 years, you're growing at more like 3% uh, now. So kind of the question is, well what about next year? If you've been watching the news, there's all sorts of concerns about, uh, you know, maybe there's going to be a recession uh, uh, coming. And there's a variety of reasons for that. One of them is, this is actually a long recovery. You know, this is uh, 2008 uh, is when the economy cratered, and you've had continuous economic growth. You don't usually grow eight to ten years in a row. Uh, so that's kind of, that's one of the reasons why, probably the primary reason why people think the economy is going to, uh, uh, is, is, is nearing recession. Uh, the counter to that is it's grown year after year after year, but it's grown at an unusually slow rate. Usually when you have a deep recession, if you look at like 81, 82, is a deep recession similar to what we just had, or just had, it's 10 years ago now, it seems like it was just yesterday, but uh, the economy normally grows five, six percent in the years following that. You know, obviously you have to take a big tank, uh, you know, uh, downturn and it, it pops up right away. It's really just grown, as I mentioned before, you know, one and a half to two and a half percent each of those years. So, we've, so you've had a relatively slow growth uh, compared to most other recoveries. So there's some sense that it's not an overheated economy because of the, the more moderate growth uh, coming out of the recession is most of the volatility in the economy comes from housing prices. That when housing, if you have a housing bubble, that's what creates the serious recessions, whether it was 2008 or 1929, uh, and, or every one in between. And the reason is because, you know, although consumer spending is 70% of the economy, it doesn't change much from year to year. It's like, you, you, there's no, ha there's no bubble in haircuts or, you know, or uh, uh, food products or, or whatever because they can't be traded, or, or excuse me, they can't be uh, invested, saved, and, and all that kind of stuff. But financial assets and physical assets, you can get a bubble in. But one of the things he's observed is if, say, the economy drops 20%, or excuse me, the stock price market drops 20%, that doesn't have the same impact on the economy as if housing prices drop 20%. And part of it is you don't put 5% down on stocks when you buy them. Most of it's in your 401k or pension or whatever, so it's leveraged to some extent. You get margin calls, you know, so if you're in the hole, they make you cough up some more money. But for, uh, but for uh, real estate, you can lose 100% of your investment. Uh, on that and so that creates a lot of volatility. So one of the concerns would be a sharp downturn in housing prices or other real estate prices might precipitate a recession. And a couple things have people worried about that. Uh, one is interest rates are going, uh, are going up. The Fed is tightening uh, rates which eventually usually leads to an increase in mortgage rates which you've, they were up about one percent last year and they're expected to go up another half a percent or so. Uh, in 2019, so that might lead to uh, 
uh, decline housing prices. The other is that in some areas, the, the new tax law would have a negative effect on housing prices. So in California, you know, if you're in the Midwest or South or whatever, it probably doesn't matter a whole lot, but in California, you can only write off mortgage interest up to a $750,000 loan. You can only write off taxes, state and property taxes, up to $10,000. And uh, if you own a house in California and you won't have enough money, make enough money to pay for that house, you're probably paying a lot of state tax, a lot of property tax <laughs> that you're not being, you're not going to be able to write off. And uh, the interest limitation is not a big deal because it's really just the amount over 750 on your loan that's going to be an issue, and it's grandfather and stuff like that. So our economists estimate that that might, depending on where you live, might reduce housing prices, you know, one to two percent in California. Uh, so you've got a little bit of a headwind from the tax law, another headwind from the increase in uh, interest rates that will lead to higher mortgage rates. So some concern is that means housing prices are going to turn down and then the party's over in terms of construction activity and all that sort of thing. Uh, our economists don't think that's a, a concern for 2019. And they've looked at it for a few ways. They look at how many new housing units do you need for to re replacement uh, versus uh, and that sort of thing to get a sense of how many new housing starts you can expect? They look at affordability. You know how much of your what percentage of your income do you have to pay for to buy the median house and things like that? None of those are in bubble range. Uh, there, the affordability is less than it used to be, uh, but it's not anywhere near where it was in the 2005, 2006 before before the recession. There's, uh, we just, with the fires this year, about 20,000 houses were lost that are going to have to be replaced. Uh, but uh, again, that's not going to be a, I mean, that's a tragedy for the individuals involved, and it's a lot of houses but, and a lot of money, but it's not relative to the overall economy a big deal. So they think uh, housing prices will continue to appreciate, but at a slower rate than they have been. So that's not going to drive us into recession. Another concern is uh, trade wars. So with the current administration, they have uh, picked a fight with a variety of people uh, around the globe, especially China, and uh, you know, have added tariffs to things like solar panels and uh, washing machines and other stuff. And uh, in March, if they don't work out a deal into March, I think it is, uh, steel tariffs and aluminum tariffs are going to kick in to kind of a more serious uh, level and so some people think if you start a trade war, that's going to uh, could be something that pushes us into into a recession. Uh, again, our economists don't think that's a, a concern. Uh, while they're all f big free trade people and think restrictions on trade are going to be harmful for the economy, it's not that uh, they don't think this is is particularly serious as a trade war. Uh, and there's a, there's a few reasons for it. Uh, one is uh, the perception is this is just the United States administration, the current administration playing hardball, trying to get better deals out of our, our trade partners than they have before, rather than a shift to, uh, away from free trade. With China in particular, uh, China's in a, a precarious position. They're, they report their economic growth is 6%, which means they're basically in a recession because it's not close to that. So, so it's probably more like 1.5%. So they've got uh, basically no economic growth going on right now. They also are very heavily leveraged, so a downturn will affect them uh, more, uh, more significantly. So I say heavily leveraged. Uh, I've seen numbers and, and others may have seen, you know, it's, it's never very certain that their debt is about 120 percent of GDP. So that's like Greece type of uh, situation. So they can't afford uh, much of a downturn. Their economy is far more dependent on exports to the United States than we are. Uh, to them. Now your industries in particular, the steel and aluminum tariffs I'm sure uh, affect you, but uh, it's more significant. There's also a couple other long-term trends that I think are, are concerning for China. Uh, one is demographic. Because of their one-child policy, it's a rapidly aging country. Uh, so they're very not far off from looking like the uh, same demographics as Japan. And uh, 
uh, aging countries tend to have low economic growth. The number of people by 2030, I heard some numbers, and, and again, I don't know if these people make this stuff up or not, but the numbers I've heard is there's about, gonna be about 230 million people in China that are over 65 in 2030. So that's a lot of people and, they're gonna, and how they're gonna be supported is not, is not obvious. Countries like Japan that have dealt with similar uh, demographics have had no economic growth. So that's uh, a bit of a concern. Another concern that I think I've, what I've read seems to be downplayed a lot more significantly than I would. And that is the change in the political system there. There's a couple things. Uh, one is the leader of China uh, just pushed through uh, uh, a repeal of essentially term limits there. So this individual could be the dictator for life in China. And independent of the human rights abuses that have historically go along with that sort of thing, uh, centralized power is usually bad for economic growth. Uh, the second is uh, there's more almost a cult of personality that's starting to develop there. So I don't know if those of you that, that spend time in China, but you're starting to see his picture up you know, on the wall next to Mao and things like that and uh, oaths that you, you know, need to say to him and, and when you're getting marriage ceremonies and things like that that suggest, uh, again, the type of thing that, that I would do if I were dictator for life. I would insist on that <laughs> myself. Uh, and it would be harmful for the economy and uh, China has a history of those, of those things uh, you know, unwinding very poorly. So I think between the demographics, the deterioration of the political uh, uh, system, a kind of a turn away, uh, basically the past 10 years they've kind of stopped the market reforms there. Uh, the over leverage that has kind of uh, propped up the economy to some extent. I think the, the bottom line with that is China's gonna deal because uh, they're, they're gonna be under a lot more pressure than, than the United States is gonna be to do that. So. Uh, so I don't think we expect that to be a, uh, a big concern uh, uh, going forward. So where does that put us? Uh, so for 2018, of course, the final numbers are not in yet. Uh, but uh, uh, let's see, I think I've skipped a slide in here. Maybe it's in here. No. Uh, we expect the economy to slow a little bit nationally uh, to growing at about 2.6%. Uh, this coming year, but nothing close to recession. Now 2020 might be a different uh, different story. For California in particular, here's some kind of indicators of what we're looking at for growth here. Uh, again, by and large, we expect a little slowing, but nothing close to, to a recession. Uh, personal income, we expect to continue to be strong. Uh, payroll growth, which is the closest to kind of GDP growth, we only expect to be about one and a half percent down from two percent this year. I picked a couple industries that might be uh, particularly relevant to you. Uh, uh, maybe not, but again you see the similar pattern of, of, of uh, strong growth last year going to uh, kind of moderate growth this year. Uh, housing prices, again, we expect the growth and the increase to be about half of what it was, but still not uh, zero. So all of these would suggest, again, a slowing economy, but nothing cratering. Uh, in Orange County, and again, as I mentioned before, we do this estimate separately for the Inland Empire, uh, but they haven't released those numbers yet. I tried to get them from them, and they just said, you know, no, they would have to kill me if they told me. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling they're almost the same as Orange County. Uh, the uh, it's Inland Empire tends to be a little more volatile than Orange County. It's on a downturn. They're going to take a bigger hit, and when the economy is growing, they usually grow a little bit faster. Uh, so it should be fairly similar. But again, we expected Southern California to be growing a little bit better than the state as a whole, <coughs> and probably a little slower uh, than the nation as a whole. So that's that's kind of where we are uh, with the economy now. One thing, of course, that you, you may be aware of or you may have forgotten, uh, the government's closed. And uh, <laughs> so we don't actually have, have a government going on right now. And so what, what's, what's the issue with that and what's the impact and, and that sort of thing. And so 
for particular individuals uh, that work uh, in, in those areas that are, are closed. So when they say the government's shut down, it's about 25% uh, of the government is shut down. It's not really most of it. Uh, and some percentage of those are working, and they'll all get yeah, paid at some point and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but it does create a cash flow problem sometimes uh, for some individuals, so I don't mean to diminish that. And there are certain, if, you have, if you're dealing with the IRS and trying to get an answer out of them, and, or other regulatory agencies, there's probably some transactions you're doing that are being held up. But by and large, I think most people have forgotten that the economy, that, the, that there's been a government shutdown. And uh, what they're theoretically arguing about is uh, uh, border security. Uh, the Trump administration would like five billion dollars to begin building some sort of border barrier uh, and the uh, uh, Congress, both the House and frankly the Senate, uh, do not want to spend money on border security and so they're, they're kind of at an impasse. Uh, in my mind th that's a largely unimportant question. And it's not unimportant because it's unimportant whether there's a wall or not, but it's five billion dollars, which in you know the government spends four point four trillion. Five billion, that's like the bar tab tonight, you know, probably is is that. So it's not a big amount of money they're actually fighting over. It's not gonna build an entire wall, uh, and it's not gonna result in no security, you know, if you don't fund it. Uh, and anytime you hear the debate focused on you know, who's going to lose face, you know, it doesn't matter. The, if, if Trump backed down and worked out some deal or the House backed down or they more likely figure out some Weasley way so they can claim they both backed down, the other side backed down, you know, a month after it occurs, nobody's going to care, uh, uh, frankly. What the real concern here is, is the federal budget's out of control. Uh, if you, this just gives you a few, a uh, uh, few years. Uh, if you look at 2019, what the Trump administration, what was proposed, would be a 4.4 trillion dollar budget. <coughs> so that's up 560 billion dollars from just 2016. In 2016, we're in exactly the lean years in, in government spending. And if you can see the line on how much you're increasing spending, four to five percent now accelerating, frankly, uh, since uh, the Trump administration's been in office. Uh, and you can see how much taxes are increasing. Obviously, you're going to get a deficit, uh, an increasing deficit. To just put this in perspective, historically, uh, the government spent, the federal government spends about 20 percent of GDP. So, uh, and when I say historically, if you're talking about like 1980 through, you know, now. If you did 1990 through now, it'd be about a little bit more than 20%. But it's, we're not talking about 1860s or, or whatever. Uh, so this is in, in recent years. This, in 2019, they'll spend 21% of GDP. That 1% is $210 billion. So if you look at two-thirds of the increase in spending, in 2019 over say 2018, most of it is if they had just spent 20% of GDP like they normally do, that would be $200 billion less. So it's basically two thirds of that. Now where does that increase come from? There's, there's two, two big sources. One is what they refer to as mandatory spending, which is spending that, there are, that there's a formula for. So Medicare, Social Security, interest, you gotta pay all that stuff. Uh, that increases about $200 billion a year, those three elements. About $130 billion, $135 billion for Medicare and Social Security and Medicaid, and then about $60 billion for interest each year. So that's $200 billion of it. The other $100 billion is discretionary spending. So the discretionary spending part is about one, expected to be uh, $1.3 trillion in 2019. So that's defense spending and uh, basically every, everything else. So the stuff that, uh, most of it's the stuff they're fighting over uh, right now. There was a, a law passed a number of years ago, not as coming out of the recession, a sequester, you know, one of these last budget deals, where they limited the increase in discretionary spending. And 
if they uh, ab abided by that, discretionary spending in 2019 would be a little over 1.1 trillion. Instead, it's 1.3 trillion. So they're about 170 billion dollars above what they're legally, what they were legally supposed to be constrained to. Now, if you ask people in Congress uh, what the spending problem is, they're going to say it's the mandatory spending. We've got to do this. Be Paul Ryan. We've got to do something about Medicare, Social Security. That's growing out of control. People getting older. That's you know getting get more and more expensive. The discretionary spending doesn't matter. And on one level, that makes sense. It's 1.3 trillion out of the 4.4 trillion. The other 3 trillion is is other stuff. The problem with that logic is the discretionary spending is stuff that's used to distort the economy. This can range, you know, for this is paying for regulations that distort the economy. It's handouts to uh, uh, as uh, political favors. Uh, and, and again, during the Obama administration, it would have been, you know, sol Solyndra's and, and places like that that are focused on green energy. Tesla got five billion dollars, and uh, Obama starts and he cuts off them, and suddenly Tesla's going broke. And uh, but presumably somebody else is getting similar deals. Uh, and that's why that grows. So that that discretionary part, you know, I would argue that a dollar spent in the dis what they call discretionary spending is more damaging to the economy than a dollar spent in the mandatory spending. You don't destroy income that much, or, uh, economic growth that much by transferring wealth from one person to another. You do destroy it by uh, killing transactions, by favoring some industries, some companies, over the others. So. Uh, so I would argue that that increase in discretionary spending is a real problem uh, that they need to focus on. Now again, why did it explode uh, over the past two years? Because the uh, Trump administration did a deal uh, that involved if you let us increase defense spending, we'll let you increase you know, spending on the stuff you care about. And so they both said, we'll give you another hundred billion for defense, another hundred billion for the other stuff. and. Uh, Call it a deal. So that's one of the reasons why I'm not so happy about collaborative, you know, government uh, bipartisan deals. These always seem to cost us money. So this, as you can see, the bottom line: this is getting expensive, and it's not going to get any cheaper. Uh, so that that's sort of the real concern in, in my mind, and it's not uh, the focus of, of discussion. Uh, now, as, as part of my practice here, you know, I usually go through sort of the economic numbers and, and bore the hell out of you in, the, in that process, and then get to the political stuff where I just kind of alienate uh, some subset of the room. And so let me begin that process too. And uh, I want to talk about the election of 2018 uh, and what that suggests for what might happen uh, going forward. So uh, if uh, Oh, I should back up a second here before I do it. Here's some of the stuff that were the kind of the big initiatives with the Trump administration, uh, or at least what they would argue is is that case. Uh, the USMCA is the replacement of NAFTA, so they uh, eliminated NAFTA and then renegotiated it with a new agreement with Canada and uh, the United States, and that came through. They did criminal justice reform. Uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh was uh, uh, nominated to the Supreme Court uh, along with other 18 other people, the Court of Appeals, 47 District Court. Uh, this is a lot of judges. In 2017, he also appointed a lot of judges, and he's very fond of talking about how they've appointed more judges at this time than any other person in history, and uh, Mitch McConnell in the Senate is very proud of that. It's actually not that much more than the Obama administration. Uh, they also had two Supreme Court justices the first two years. Uh, they had 45 district court uh, uh, appointments in his second year, and I think 15 or so at Court of Appeals. So it's somewhat more, but it's not radically different than, than would be typical. Uh, on that particular note, uh, of course, you've probably heard that uh, uh, Ruth uh, Ginsburg has uh, not been attending the court uh, uh, oral arguments, and you know, so everybody's, you know, speculating what that means. Uh, on one level, it doesn't mean a whole lot because uh, it's not uncommon for somebody who's sick to not show up at for the oral arguments. The oral arguments are more ceremonial than anything else. Uh, for example, Clarence Thomas never really asks any questions in them because he thinks they're kind of silly. 
Uh, so it's not a big deal. You can read the briefs and all that kind of thing. When Rehnquist was Chief Justice, uh, he missed 45 cases, which is basically half of the half of them they have any particular year, and uh, you know nothing much happened. The vast majority of the cases are are unanimous or or disproportionately you know one side or the other. It's very rare that you have like a five four. Uh, case those are only a handful, uh, so it's not the big uh, the end of the world. On the other hand, the year that Rehnquist missed those 45 cases, he also stepped uh, you know passed away and stepped down. Uh, so she is in fact in very bad health. Uh, I've met her and actually been in an elevator with her, and she's been in bad health for a long time, and she's not the only one. So it's very likely that Trump will have at least one more uh, uh, nominee and not. To you know, uh, uh, in, in disrespect to her, she's not the only one. Both Stephen Breyer, and uh, is also in not particularly good health, and, and that sort of thing. So he probably will have at least one more uh, appointment this term, which I can't wait to see. If this was <laughs> if this is Kavanaugh replacing, uh, you can imagine what this one's going to be like. Uh, I'm very confident that he's a racist, child abuser, uh, Nazi. I'm not sure who they're going to nominate, but uh, uh, and uh, and probably eats eats small children or something. But uh, we'll see, we'll see how it goes. It might actually even be a bad a bad <coughs> choice, but. Uh, that's going to be uh, historic, I think, in terms of the extent to which that's going to be, be fought. Uh, some of the other th things he did, he's, he started to cut off foreign aid to uh, Palestinians, Syrians, and uh, Pakistan, uh, did some tariffs on, on a few things, uh, started the uh, inklings of a, what seems like a positive deal with, uh, with North Korea that might result in them rolling back their nuclear uh, ambitions, but appears to have at least stalled them uh, somewhat. Uh, he just announced more recently uh, withdrawal uh, from Syria. There's a little less there than meets the eye. There's only like 2,000 people in Syria, the military, U.S. soldiers uh, right now uh, in the first place. Uh, and this is something he announced six months ago, actually. But one of the things you notice if you look at that list is most of that stuff is other than the trade agreement and justice reform, the rest of it is, and I guess the judges, the rest of it's all foreign policy stuff. And this is the pattern you tend to see with presidents, their first year or two is when they get the domestic stuff passed, and then after that they can't work with Congress and they usually focus on foreign policy issues that doesn't require congressional approval. So it's not a coincidence that you see a lot less on this list than you did for 2017 when you had tax reform, uh, for example, that radically changed it. What you don't see on this list is health care reform, which he was pushing, uh, infrastructure uh, development, uh, immigration reform, of course. Uh, it doesn't even have a budget. So uh, a lot of the things that were on the, on the uh, target list didn't get done last year. Uh, and going forward, uh, you can expect n no major legislation uh, to pass. And part of it is the, the recent election we'll talk a little bit about, but part of it is they never get anything passed the last two years of their first term. Part of it is the last year of their first term, they're running for re-election and, and uh, that sort of thing. And uh, usually they get a setback in the midterm elections, which Trump was a special example for. So let's get to that. So what happened in 2018? Well, good news for Democrats. Uh, so it was a, a big win for them on, on uh, most dimensions, and they have a new face for the Democratic Party, uh, who is, uh, is really now their primary spokesman uh, uh, for the party. She's really kind of eclipsed uh, the, in some of it's her persona, some of it's her media uh, uh, style, and some of it is that the, the, the traditional leaders of the Democratic Party are an uninspiring uh, group at this stage of their career. But what ended up happening? Well, they picked up 40 seats in the House. 40 is a lot. You know, you, you, you kind of figure you're going to lose some, you know, at least 15 or so. And given the economy doing well and Trump, despite the media being relatively popular, that's not normally associated with losing 40 seats in the House. Uh, it would be more like the 15 to 20 and maybe they eked out the 23 that got them the control. Uh, but 40 
they, they uh, blew them away. They also picked up seven governorships. And if you look at state houses and, and that sort of thing, they had a similar order of magnitude. So this is a big win uh, for them. There's no kind of question about it. Uh, if you look at the Senate, uh, the Senate, the Republicans actually picked up two seats. And part of that is just an unfavorable uh, uh, set of people going up for re-election. A lot of states that Trump won, uh, the senators uh, were Democrats in there. And, and so frankly, the two Senate seats would have been the low end of what you would expect the Republicans to pick up. They didn't get uh, the seat in West Virginia. Trump won West Virginia by like 38%, but the Democrats still won that. Uh, they didn't pick up Montana, uh, for example. Uh, so there's a few others that you would have expected them to pick up if it was a decent year they didn't get. Uh, so w what does this mean? Well, a couple things. Well, first of all, in the Senate, the impact's a little bit bigger than that number suggests. Not only did you pick up two seats, but you, so the Republicans won four seats from Democrats, and they lost two seats, so it's a net uh, uh, two. The two seats they lost were held by never Trumpers. So uh, Arizona and uh, with Jeff Flake and Heller in Nevada. So you've replaced them with two people who don't support Trump on the Democrat side. Uh, there was a, in, in Tennessee, uh, Marsha Blackburn won. It was an open seat, but it was held by uh, Bob Corker, who is also a never Trumper type guy. So they actually, so if you're Trump, you picked up two seats, but you picked up five people that supported you and had a couple seats that uh, they didn't support you much in the, in the first place. So it's actually a little bit, it's a more conservative move than would be implied by just picking up two seats. The significance of that is judges. I mean, nothing's going to pass this year anyway because you have to get the House to pass it, Democratic House to pass it, the Republican Senate to pass it, and then you get to have to get Trump to sign it. So nothing major is probably going to happen. Uh, but judges only require 51 votes uh, in the Senate, don't involve the House uh, at all. And uh, the Vice President can, can break a tie. And some of the people that we're holding out on Kavanaugh are not there now. So probably have a little bit easier time getting, uh, getting judges through is, is the implication of this. Uh, if we're looking at 2020, in the House, the Republicans would need 18 seats to regain control. Uh, you would think that 18, you know, the 18 is not a trivial amount. That would have to be, it would normally be a healthy victory. Uh, but the Democrats have, and this is based on the Cook Report, which is uh, left center kind of. Uh, interpretation of these races. So uh, they have 17 of those Democrats up for re-election as toss-ups and only two Republican seats as toss-ups. And that's for the obvious reason that any Republican that was a toss-up lost, basically, last time. Uh, they also have another 17 Democrats that they consider leaning Democrat and 12 leaning Republican. So there's basically 34 Democratic seats at risk and about 14 Republican seats at risk. So how it turns out obviously is going to be a, a function of, of the presidential election, uh, but uh, it suggests that if the Republican wins re-election, they'll probably pick up the House. If they lose, uh, they probably uh, won't get there, but it'll be a somewhat narrower. Uh, the Democrats also had what I guess you could euphemistically call some innovative uh, get out the vote strategies this year. And uh, uh, they have various vote harvesting strategies that the Republicans didn't use. Presumably the Republicans will be onto that and narrow the gap in sort of those uh, election day uh, tactics. And uh, so some of those seats in Orange County, for example, in California, all of the Republicans in Orange County lost. Uh, that's, some of them are probably going to uh, flip back as they uh, don't get outsmarted on election day. In terms of the Senate, there's 12 Democrats running for, re running for election and 21 Republicans. So you would think this is uh, going to be bad news for Republicans. It's going to be tough to maintain the Senate. Actually, if you look through who's running, it's going to be pretty hard for the Democrats to flip the Senate, even though they only need a few seats. 
Uh, the reason is there are two Republicans running that are at risk. Uh, Arizona and Nevada are, are, excuse me, Arizona and Colorado are considered toss-ups. I mean, obviously it's early and, you know, people can do stupid stuff and suddenly put their seat at risk. But at this stage, uh, those are, are, are at risk. And the Democrats have the Senate seat from Alabama that they won in a special election that, they're, that there's almost no way they're going to hold. So the Democrats are going to lose one for sure and might pick up a couple and unless it's kind of a wave election, then, then everybody, else should, everybody else should be fine. Uh, so, uh, so again, it's looking like uh, that, again, unless there's a wave election, that uh, the Republicans will hold the Senate and, and the Democrats will probably hold the House. Now, having said that, who knows what's going to happen in, in this election. You don't know whether Trump's going to run for re-election. You don't know if he does. What's going to happen? Is it something where, you know, if he, if he wins, they probably pick up, you know, both the House and the Senate and they're back to where they were. Uh, if he loses, it's entirely possible it could be a blowout, in which case lots of other people are going to be at risk for, for losing their seat. Uh, but I wanted to kind of close with something. I got a little quiz for you. I want to see how many people recognize these individuals. So how many people know him? Anybody? What about him? No? Stop me if you recognize any of these people. Nope. There you got one. Yeah. So basically, these are the people that are running for president on the Democratic side. These are the people who have declared. Uh, one of them you should know. She's the senator from California. It's, uh, or she hasn't declared, but she's likely to. Kamala Harris. Somebody got the senator from, uh, from uh, Hawaii, Hawaii uh, Tulsi Gabbard. That's Kristen Gildebrand is the uh, senator from New York. Uh, Julian Castro, he was the mayor of San Antonio and a cabinet secretary. I've forgotten who the other guy is. Uh, he was from Maryland somewhere. The other one's from West Virginia. That's actually Marion Williamson, who I think is a, like a, uh, what is, I mean, she like a motivational speaker or something like that or whatever she's going. There's a couple more. There's uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren. And uh, Joe Biden has indicated that uh, if he can walk, he will run. So, uh, the, uh, uh, the point here is, and of course there's some others that are circling around, is last year the Republican side was a free-for-all, or last time, the Republican side was free-for-all. They had 16 different people uh, uh, running, and uh, this year it's going to be a real free-for-all for Democrats. The, the Republicans basically in 2016, uh, the, the extracted themselves from the control of the Bush family. The Democrats did not extract themselves from the Clintons last year, and so this year, they are, this time they are. And so while that was a painful process uh, for the Republicans, because when you think about it, two presidents, 15 years, there's thousands of people that own their, or their jobs and careers and made a ton of money off of them, uh, it's a painful process to do that. It's the same thing with the Clintons. They've sucked up all of the donors and, and uh, everybody else associated with it. So making that transition is going to be fairly painful. And just like the Republicans had no, I, I, would, I don't think I'm going out on a limb here to say that Trump was not an obvious choice. Uh, as the next uh, presidential nominee, there isn't one on the Democrat side, the Speaker of the House, the uh, Senate Majority Leader, any of those kinds of people, none of them are, are likely to run, uh, you know, because of the stage of their career and all the stuff they've probably pulled over the years. But uh, so you're looking at somebody kind of out of the blue uh, or, or a fresh face is what the Democrats would like to see. So it's, uh, it's really all bets are off as to you're, you're likely to have a Democratic nominee that is uh, uh, not well tested. I don't think Joe Biden is, is going to be a serious uh, candidate. He might have been a very serious candidate in 2016, uh, but he's going to be 78 years old in uh, uh, 2020 
and I'm, you know, I'm 76, and you know, I can tell you right now, no, I'm not. But uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's not likely to fly uh, at that at that stage, uh, given health problems and everything else. So it's going to be a wide open year. Now, one thing I would sort of confidently predict here is, and this is something I don't think a, a lot of people have, have thought about, or at least I haven't read this as much, is the next two years are going to be, uh, especially next year, are going to be a wild ride. And because last, until the Republicans lost the House, Trump had to be nice. He had to work with Paul Ryan, who doesn't like him, to try to get some votes. He had to, to get anything passed. He had to schmooze all of the Washington insiders. And that was him being nice and cooperative. Now he doesn't. He's never going to win a uh, vote in the House, so he doesn't have to be cooperative uh, anymore. He has no incentive to do it. So you'll see, for example, the, the shutdown that we're going through right now. Uh, you're going to see a lot more of that because you have nothing to lose. At, at this stage, uh, nothing to kind of moderate uh, that impulse. So for some of you, that will be you know, good news. Uh, for some of you, that'll be bad news. For all of you, I think it'll be entertaining. So one way or the other. Uh, so anyway, with that, if you have any uh, questions or, or you'd like to ask, yes? Something that you didn't mention, and I'm assuming he says you didn't, probably will happen, but will he, uh, will he finish his full term? And if he does, you, know, you mentioned that what yeah. you would probably go for re election, but if he doesn't finish his term, what's the wild ride going to look like? Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any chance that he's not going to finish his term uh, for a couple reasons. One is it's kind of late. They haven't even started the, uh, I, I mean, assuming you're thinking the House is going to vote to impeach him and stuff, you know, he could run out the clock if he wanted to. Secondly, the Senate would have to pick it up and uh, they're not going to uh, because they're Republican controlled. Uh, and third, even if they did, they'd have to get two-thirds of the vote to remove him. So that's never happened and uh, is, not li is not going to. Uh, so without any judgment about whatever the merits of what people are concerned about with him, uh, just procedurally it's not going to happen. Uh, as is a kind of a secondary point, if you're a Democrat, I'm not so sure what the point of removing Trump and replacing him with Mike Pence is. Uh, I don't see how you, you somehow think you're going to win in that one. Mike Pence is a, is a more solid conservative uh, than Trump. He's kind of a more predictable conservative. And those are all sorts of things that you're, you're of course, concerned about. Uh, Trump is a guy that's a little less predictable. You can deal with him on the infrastructure. You know, he wants to spend a lot of money to, to invest in infrastructure. That's something Democrats can support. So maybe you can work out something on that. Uh, but uh, this isn't like, you know, uh, Nixon, you know, being replaced by uh, Ford, who is somebody who's everybody's uh, a buddy. So I, I don't see there's any chance that, that that's going to happen. And it, again, it's not based on whether or not uh, Mueller you know, has some evidence that he bought off somebody or whatever it is that they're uh, uh, concerned about. I think this is just more hassling the guy uh, type of stuff. Uh, having said that, that isn't to imply that he'll necessarily run for re-election. But, yeah. <coughs> well, the differences in the mortgage market and help mitigate any downturn in, in housing prices compared to 2000 in terms of mortgage practices. You mean the fact that you can, you know, get uh, that they're they're not likely to be as as flex indiscriminate in giving loans and that yeah, sort of thing. And the mortgage backed securities and all that that ripple effect on Wall Street. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be a harder to have a, a significant bubble as a result of that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Kind of shifting into a lot of national politics. I'm curious what the local economists are thinking about the state politics, being that. It was a bit of a landslide where the legislature is in California, new governor. What do you, how does, does that mitigate what you're seeing from a federal standpoint, or what does that mean to us in the Inland Empire and so forth? Uh, well, yeah, you, you, as you mentioned it, now they have a majority, uh, uh, super majority in the Senate, so it's, it's basically the Democrats are running the state. And I have to say, this is one of the mistakes uh, the Republicans have made. Uh, if they care about this stuff is obviously you're not going to win the governor's race anytime soon in California and you're not going to win a Senate race and as a result they don't spend any money here but you lost a half a dozen 
House races and some state Senate races because you didn't campaign here. So I hope in, you know, or if you're a Republican, I should say, you should hope that they invest a lot more money out here than they did and a lot more time to make sure that the winnable districts are won and not just worry about their prospects at the top of the ticket. So I think it was a huge mistake for them to write off California uh, the way that they have. Uh, having said that, now that they control the legislature and the Senate and everything else, uh, uh, yeah, I, I, again, if, you're, if you prefer limited government, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, luck. It's not, uh, it's not likely if, if you're on that side of the aisle that you, any of the concerns you have are going to be mitigated. I'm sure they're going to be accelerated. And again, if you are on the, if you're liberal, then you know you consider this good news as a chance to to be more aggressive than you have been. But yeah, definitely the public policy is going to be tilted more to the left than it has been. But, yes. What's the what's the near term exciting economic driver in sectors? Like what 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 do you see? 18, 19, 20, the driving our economy is exciting. Yeah, great, great question. And uh, you know, you you probably have. It was her question. I don't. Know, what, did she have a good answer to that? I don't know because I because I'm in the process of trying to make something up here. But uh, if, Frank, to be honest with you, you guys know more than I do. You're you're the ones that are are uh, work, distributing this stuff. Uh, that the I, I can look at it from a business school. What we worry about the most is taking advantage of the data revolution. Is the fact that gathering data has dropped dramatically in cost means that uh, there's more stuff to analyze, and and so we're retooling our curriculum to get more data analytics classes. Not so much to be the guy in the basement coding the stuff, but rather the business person being familiar uh, with the opportunities and the analytical techniques. So it's more statistics, more data visualization, and that sort of thing, because that's being applied, you know, to every every field. Uh, so. That's, that's kind of what we're worried about. That's not a particular industry or sector. Uh, uh, but now that you can put a sensor on everything for nothing and can do something with that information that's valuable, uh, that's, that's kind of changed uh, a lot. Uh, the other, you know, healthcare is still uh, a growing segment. It's, you know, whatever it is, 18, 17, 18 percent of the economy. People are getting older uh, and they consume more uh, Healthcare services as they get older, so that's going to be a, a growing, you know, exploding segment of the economy, and that's one that's also going to be a very uh, innovative one because kind of the current models ha have have changed pretty dramatically. Uh, so just intervening because you you broke something or had a heart attack or whatever, versus trying to keep you out of the hospital and improve the quality of your life when you're in your 80s. Uh, is going to be a much bigger investment, and there's all sorts of opportunities there. So, certainly in, in Southern California, healthcare we expect to be to uh, to be a huge opportunity. But uh, but what did she, what did she say? She, <laughs> yeah, yeah, same thing. Yeah. What are some other questions? Anybody else have uh, anything else, or is it? Yeah. I just have a question on the the interest that's being saved for 25% of government that's not being used. What point does that exceed five billion dollars? Oh, great, great, great question. Because yeah, you're say, so you're talking about uh, you know you might think it's 25 percent of the government, so 25 percent of four trillion, that's like a trillion dollars per year that you would save, and it's been a month, so that's whatever 800 billion a month you're saving. It's not quite that because a lot of the spending is transfer payments that are going to have to be transferred anyway. I mean, you still get your Social Security check and that kind of stuff. So it's more people. But uh, yes, the amount of money they're arguing about uh, doesn't make any sense uh, relative to the, 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 the stakes that are involved. But having said that, you know, I, again, I, I kind of wonder from the Democrats' standpoint, from the Republican standpoint, uh, if you're a, in the Republican base, you probably don't care if the government's, if you, there's a shutdown. And in fact, you might even think it's a good, good thing to show that, there's, that we are less dependent on the government than you realize. 
Uh, for the Democrats, I think that's a different story. Traditionally, when the Democrats been in power, they've deliberately closed certain things to be as disruptive as possible so that you can appreciate uh, the benefits of those uh, expenditures as possible. With Republicans, uh, they're obviously trying to mitigate uh, the disruption associated with it. So I, again, I, if I'm Trump, I'm not like feeling any pressure here. And uh, uh, the, the Democrats have already started to have a little bit of pressure of saying, what do we, you know, we, uh, we can't do anything be over, over $5 billion, let's just don't call it a wall, call it a something else and let's move on uh, so that we can kind of save face. Uh, so I, I suspect as soon as they kind of come up with something that you can call it that doesn't sound like a wall uh, and isn't five billion, then they'll do it and move on. But I think there's more time pressure for the Democrats than there are for the Republicans. But uh, do we have any any other questions or comments? Yes. Uh, we're three years into the minimum wage increase, and with another three years to go, are you seeing any impact to California? And how that is affecting the economy and uh, You know, I haven't seen data on uh, measuring it, but the, 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 the issue with the minimum wage, I think a lot of people forget, it's not, if you're talking about, you know, somebody who's now making $15 an hour instead of 12, it's that there are a lot of jobs that are tied to some multiple of the minimum wage. So, you know, typically a lot of companies, uh, Chapman for example, if you're a full-time employee, you have to make at least twice the minimum wage. So if that's, sixty thousand dollars a year then that means everybody that you're not don't want to pay sixty thousand dollars a year is now an hourly employee uh, rather than a full-time employee and that sort of thing and so a lot of organizations are like that so those are the jobs i think that where you're really affected by it uh more uh because most of the it depends on where you are in california but the minimum wage isn't really like a binding constraint to to attract the people you need uh, at, that are low skilled, you're usually paying more than minimum wage in many parts of the state, not everywhere. So it's not so much the person that's you know getting 15 instead of you know 10, 50, or 12. Uh, it's the person that's not going to be is going to be stuck in an hourly position because they don't want to convert them to uh, to you know. And I would not consider that to be a good news for the employee personally. Uh, so I think that you know the ways around it are. Uh, unlike that have a, a big negative impact in terms of economic growth or corporate profits or things like that. Uh, but uh, it will make it harder to work. And, th and this is one of the problems. One of the things we've observed I'm, is a, at a college is uh, people are a little less prepared uh, to operate independently than they used to be. Uh, and I'm, I'm one who's very skeptical about generational differences and, you know, everybody thinks 20-year-olds are entitled brats and didn't have to work as hard as we did and, you know, you probably heard that from your parents too. But there is a difference, uh, it appears to be right now, uh, and maybe for those of you who hire uh, people earlier in their career, there's a lot less independence, resourcefulness, and that sort of thing than, uh, than there used to be. And part of it, I suspect, is because their experiences before they go to college are more limited. Uh, it's hard for a 16-year-old to get a job, for example, because of the, the regulations associated with it. Probably most of the people in the room had a job when they were uh, at, at that age. And as a result, now that you're getting to college or, or whatever on their own, uh, a lot of them are struggling more than, say, you might have uh, at the time. Uh, so I think those labor laws that restrict access to people, young people, into the workforce uh, the more damaging part is uh, the skills that they don't get to benefit from, the experiences they don't get uh, to get, rather than you know the concrete economic issue. But all right, well I would ask for more questions, but you guys have like a cocktail hour coming, <laughs> and obviously uh, that's more important than this. So anyway, I would like to to take a moment and just thank you all for coming out here in the rain. What a great crowd, and I appreciated all the questions, and uh, hopefully this will kind of uh, uh, set the, the tone for you to uh, clarify your own ideas on what you think might happen and what you hope might happen. So uh, thank you again for, for inviting me here. I love coming here. Thank you.